so hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or evening, depending where you are. Uh, welcome back to uh, the Marine Data for Africa workshop for the second and last day. Uh, we hope you had a great session yesterday and that you are ready for today with the demo. So as you can see, uh, I am not Lilian, <laughs> as she was not able to join us today. So my name is Roman Zufik, and I work at Mercator Ocean International as well. And I will be your moderator today alongside Ergan, uh, who was here yesterday, and you probably know her by now. So Ergan. Hi, uh, Roman. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Ergan Fouché. I'm an ocean engineer at Novelties, which is a French company which provides innovative solutions in the fields of space, environment, and sustainable development. And so we're very pleased to be part of, the, of this uh, Copernicus Marine event. So let's start the session today by uh, taking a look at our world map. So um, uh, we had a lot of pins uh, coming up yesterday. And uh, if yours is not posted yet, go ahead. Uh, we will send the world map link in the chat. Um, so we are covering the entire African coast, basically, with a lot of people from North Africa, either Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, a lot of pins as well from the Gulf of Guinea and South Africa and even uh, Mauritius, we have one pin. So um, we have also some European pins, even Australia, Myanmar, Indonesia, so world crowd. So welcome everyone. So just to go back quickly on uh, our Zoom rules and Q&A. So we have uh, a French simultaneous interpretation. You just have to click on the right bottom of uh, Zoom, you have this uh, interpretation uh, button and then you click French and you should be able to hear everything in French from then. And also we um, will ask questions through Slido as yesterday. So you can either use the QR code or the link that will be also shared in the, in the chat to access the Slido and there you can ask question and even upvote each other's questions. So we will only have time for the most liked question probably. So don't forget to put your thumbs up. And uh, the question that will not be addressed live will still be addressed uh, by written answer afterwards anyway. So uh, I will leave the floor to Ergan that will uh, explain you the Padlet and agenda of today. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to share my screen to show you the how the padlet looks uh, on the internet can you see my screen i think so so here is the padlet it's just the same as yesterday except we have updated some of the sections so um, here in the webinar uh, and workshop uh, se uh, section sorry you can find what uh, roman has presented so the pinion location um, website you also have the q a session answers uh, from yesterday and from the webinar, and you have the replay videos of uh, the webinar and the first uh, session of the workshop. You also have plenty of tutorial videos about the um, Copernicus Marine Service, so how to register, how to search the products, how to download the products, and how to find information on the products. The third column uh, is about the e-learning material, but Fabrice is going to show you a presentation of uh, all this material uh, just after. Uh, for, again, then you have the, um, uh, the videos about the products that have been presented yesterday. And finally, you have the use cases, so examples on of uh, how to use the Copernicus Marine Service products. Uh, and these examples, they are the ones that have been presented uh, during the webinar. Um, that's it. Uh, Roman, do you want to share your screen again, please? Yes. Here it is. So um, for the next slide, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so the material that has been prepared for this uh, workshop, these are, uh, there are Jupyter notebooks that go with the uh, videos uh, that have been recorded and that explain uh, how the notebook works. <clears throat> you also have the tutorial videos recorded by the data experts from yesterday. You have other training videos on GIS and uh, about the service desk. 
and you have the user manual with all the links and all the information about the, the, the event. The Jupyter Notebooks will be available, well, they are already available in the Copernicus Marine Service Jupyter, Jupyter Lab. Uh, and you can access it uh, freely. You just have to be registered to the Copernicus Marine Service. And if you're not, uh, you can register for free um, with this link. So today we will cover um, the existing e-learning material. So Fabrice will explain you this, and then you will have a, a presentation of the Jupyter Hub environment, some practical exercise and a panoply demo. Uh, and then if we are not late, like we were yesterday, we will have a short 10 minute break uh, for you to take a coffee or something. And then we will have other demo like the Jupyter notebook demo and uh, with the in-situ data and then QGIS demo as well. So long uh, workshop day and a lot of work. So let's uh, not wait more and start with our first speaker. So Fabrice Messal is working at Mercator Ocean International on uh, user experience and capacity development. And he will present you the e-learning material and the Jupyter Hub environment. So hello Fabrice. Hello Roman, hello Aragon, hello everyone. I'm very pleased to be here with you today and thank you for joining us uh, to all the participants. So I will share my screen <clears throat> to give you this overview of the, the learning material uh, accessible on the Copernicus Marine uh, Service website. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all the developers and people from Novelties uh, and Bazarotland, for example, who uh, made a great uh, job to uh, produce uh, all this uh, e learning material dedicated for uh, Africa. We tried to gather all the links on the Padlet to, uh, uh, to access all this material and uh, the link to the Jupyter Hub environment. Uh, so let's start from uh, the Padlet and uh, with this column on e learning material. So uh, we produced a participant manual to explain you a, a little bit uh, how to manage the Jupyter Hub environment for um, beginners. And let's first uh, discover the practical uh, uh, material uh, accessible on the website. So if I click on this link, you directly um, go uh, on the e-learning material web page. So you can see there is a lot of uh, material with uh, behind these uh, different squares, and you can sort all this material by uh, level, by subject, by tool. If you need uh, Python scripts, uh, GIS tutorial, uh, Snap uh, tutorial video, Panoply. So this is different softwares you can use to access the NetCDF data from the Copernicus Marine Service. And you can search by uh, region also. If I click, if I enter Africa and I uh, sort the, the result, you can see you have all this material related to reg uh, your region. And this is a fresh material accessible uh, from now. Uh, so in pink, you have all the Jupyter notebooks available with the different uh, topics on different topics. For example, monitoring the, a cyclone, monitoring a, a river discharge, uh, an appalling phenomenon. And in green, you have a GIS tutorial. And if you click on this uh, uh, material, you will see on the page, you get an explanation of the tutorial. And here, for example, for the GIS uh, material, you have access to the user uh, manual and uh, the, the video. Okay, I click here, for example, on the, on the Jupyter Notebook and is it, uh, it's exactly the same. So you have access to the Jupyter Notebook and the tutorial video uh, dedicated to the uh, Jupyter Notebook. Okay. Um, so here on the YouTube <coughs> uh, channel of the Copernicus Marine Service, you have the playlist here, the link to the playlist. And we try to gather all the uh, tutorial videos related to this training uh, workshop 
in this playlist. So you have access to the Jupyter tutorial videos, the GIS tutorial, and also the replay of the different sessions. Okay. Let's move to, to the Jupyter environment. So on the website, uh, we produce this page to explain you how to access the Jupyter environment to uh, launch uh, the Jupyter notebook. So you have different solutions available. You can have online solutions of, on, or uh, offline solution. Offline solution, it's more for uh, experimented uh, participants who can have access to their uh, computer and they can install uh, the software. Uh, so there is a, a dedicated uh, list of libraries you have to install uh, with uh, this uh, software called Anaconda. But let's focus on the online solutions. You have two possibilities, or you can use the Wikio platform, which is the Copernicus Data Information Access Service platform. This is free. You have just two uh, uh, to register and you have access to all the catalogs uh, of the Copernicus services. But for you, uh, and especially for you, we have this Jupyter Hub environment uh, dedicated on the, for the Copernicus Marine Service. And to access this uh, Jupyter Hub, this is the, uh, the link here, Jupyter Hub access. Okay, you have just to click here. So, the only uh, requirement is to be registered to the Copernicus Marine Service. And then you can use your user uh, name and password of your uh, uh, credential of the Copernicus Marine Service. And <clears throat> you log and you access directly on the Jupyter platform. Here you will see uh, the folder shared notebooks. On shared notebooks, there is a folder Training Africa. And here you have the list of the different uh, Jupyter notebooks available. Okay. So the Jupyter Hub is a web based application. This is very um, user friendly. This is very simple to use. Um, this is very a powerful tool for training because. Uh, through the Jupyter Notebooks, experts are able to share with you explanation with narrative uh, text and uh, illustration, and also a piece of codes, for example, here. And as, as you can see, uh, each part of the Jupyter Notebook, uh, uh, the Jupyter Notebooks is composed by cells, and you have just to run uh, cell after cells just uh, with this button, with the play button, okay? So the most important to start is to make a copy of that because here the Jupyter Notebooks are uh, in the public folder uh, called the Share Notebook. And first of all, you have to copy on your home directory the notebooks uh, you want to, uh, to, to practice, okay? And to do that, again, Back to the Padlet, there is a participant manual. You click on the participant manual. And in the participant manual, you will find all the explanation uh, necessary to uh, run the Jupyter Notebook and this link, this command line, you have just to copy paste and don't forget the uh, last dot at the end, okay, copy, and here, paste, enter. And now I have a copy on my home directory of this folder, Jupyter Notebook Introduction. And from here, I can launch the Jupyter Notebook by double clicking on it. And then, first of all, you need to quick up, clear all our outputs and then you can run the Jupyter Notebook starting like that. I click play and you see uh, the blue bar. Okay, this is uh, the, the cell I run each time I click on play. Okay, I click, I click, I click. And when there is a piece of code, there is a star here into the brackets. 
it means that the uh, you have the computer, the server is uh, computing. And when it's done, you will see a number. Okay. And you have just to follow the Jupyter notebook. And you can change, you can make some modifications and some uh, change on the Jupyter notebook. But you need to copy on your home directory if you want to save all your modifications. If you try to make some modifications on the public folder, the modifications uh, will not be saved. Okay. So I hope uh, I was clear. For any question about the Jupyter notebook, uh, the Jupyter Hub environment, don't hesitate to contact the service desk of the Copernicus Marine Service. And I hope you will enjoy uh, practicing all this material and that you will find benefits in this material. So enjoy. It's your turn. Uh, thank you, Fabrice, for uh, your presentation. Uh, we will now give the floor to one of my colleagues from Novelties, uh, Simon Boitard, who is an Earth Observation and Remote Sensing Engineer, and he is going to show you practical exercises dedicated to dedicated for Africa. So these are the exercises uh, that uh, Fabrice mentioned before. Hi, Simon. The floor is Hello. yours. Hello again. Thanks. So I'm going to share my screen. So hello everyone, my name is uh, Simon Boitard and I work as a remote sensing uh, engineer for Novartis. So today I am going to give you a brief and general introduction to the practical learning material that we have developed specifically for you for this Copernicus Marine Service Workshop dedicated to the African continent. So we have uh, implemented two types of learning materials for you. On one hand, uh, we will show you how you can use Python codes in Jupyter Notebooks in order to download, open, explore, and process Copernicus Marine Service products to study uh, various phenomena over the African continent. On the other hand, we have also implemented various scenarios to uh, explore and process Copernicus Marine Service products in the QGIS software. So let me first introduce you to the Jupyter Notebook material, and then I will uh, give you a brief introduction to the QGIS scenarios. So the first uh, notebook you should have a look at before uh, starting to work on the practical scenarios is our introductory notebook. So Ergan will uh, give a live demo of this notebook later in the session. So this notebook is really uh, meant for participants who don't uh, necessarily have a strong familiarity with the Python coding language and the Jupyter uh, notebook environment. So by exploring this notebook, you will learn how you can uh, retrieve data from the Copernicus Marine Service data store. You will uh, also learn about the NetCDF structure. So uh, NetCDF is a very common way of storing and distributing scientific data. And most of the Copernicus Marine Service products come in a NetCDF file format. Eventually, uh, by exploring this notebook, you will also learn how you can open and explore NetCDF files uh, using Python codes that are in our Jupyter uh, notebook coding cells. After this, the first uh, scenario we have uh, developed for you to explore is about monitoring an upwelling event in Northwest Africa. Later on during the session, uh, Ergan will also give a live demonstration of this uh, Jupyter notebook. So for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with uh, the upwelling phenomenon, um, the upwelling occurs when strong winds blow parallel to a coastline. So these strong winds will push away the warm surface water off the coasts, and this gives room for an upwelling of cold and nutrient-rich water to the surface. Usually after this, the phytoplankton will feed on these nutrients and uh, will uh, 
later on, a chlorophyll bloom will uh, occur, and this will attract many other marine species to the area. That's why upwelling zones are uh, lie amongst uh, the most productive uh, fishing areas in the world. So to monitor an upwelling event, we will use the global uh, physical and biogeochemical model products, but also the global wind observation products. And we will have a closer look at uh, the wind strength and direction, the sea surface temperature, the nitrate and chlorophyll concentration. So during the live demonstration, Ergan will show you how you can uh, generate 2D maps of the wing uh, strength and direction evolution over a week in uh, June. And after that, you will see the correlation between a st strong winds and the decrease of the sea surface temperature and the increase of the surface nitrate, which is followed a few days later by a chlorophyll bloom. So I'm not going to say more about this. Uh, Argan will give you more detail in an hour. The second uh, use case scenarios we have developed is about monitoring the Congo River discharge in the Atlantic Ocean. So to monitor this complex interface between the Congo River basin and the Atlantic Ocean, we will use the global physical model products uh, as well as the biogeochemical model products the ocean chlo color uh, chlorophyll concentration observation products and the sea surface temperature uh, global observation products. And so we will have a closer look at the sea salinity, the sea surface temperature, and the chlorophyll concentration at this interface between the Congo River Basin and the Atlantic Ocean. So here are some sample figures that you will learn to generate if you decide to explore this Jupyter notebook. So you will uh, observe the sea uh, salinity, both from model and observation. And you will also learn to monitor the temperature and chlorophyll concentration gradients and see how the data from the model and the observation compare. Another uh, use case that we have uh, developed for you is how you can monitor a cyclone using a uh, Siemens product. So we'll have a particular uh, interest in the Eloise cyclone that flew over Madagascar and Mauritanian coasts last January. To monitor the storm, uh, we will use the wind global observation products, the global uh, physical model products, the sea surface temperature global observation products, and the global wave model. So using uh, these products, so combining them together, uh, we'll be able to monitor the wind speed of the storm, the sea surface temperature along the way of uh, the Eloise cyclone, and the wave height. Uh, that was generated by this particular storm. So again, some simple uh, figures that you will learn uh, to generate by exploring this notebook. So the wind speed of uh, the Eloise cyclone, uh, the wave height uh, that was generated by these strong winds, and also how the sea surface uh, temperature evolved along the way of the cyclone, and how the sea surface temperature in the model and the observation products compare. The last Jupyter uh, notebook will also be the object of a live demonstration given by uh, Paz Rodland, and it will uh, introduce you to how you can subset, analyze, and download in situ products. The Second material that we have uh, developed is about how you can use Siemens products in the QGIS software. So the first uh, scenario is all about creating a safe ship route in between two of the main South African harbors that are Durban and Cape Town, taking into account the current and wave height information that you will find in the global physical model and wave uh, products. So uh, this uh, use case scenario will be the object of a live demonstration given by uh, Etienne later on in this workshop. 
So by taking into account uh, the current strength and direction combined with the wave height, you'll be able to uh, create a safe uh, shipping route that takes advantage of the current conditions, but also avoid the most hazardous uh, wave conditions. The last uh, scenarios that we have uh, developed for you is about how you can monitor a marine heat wave in the Red Sea. So for those of you who are not necessarily uh, familiar with this kind of phenomenon, a marine heat wave is a discrete and prolonged period of abnormally warm sea surface temperature. So it's defined relatively to a climatology, so to uh, regular sea surface temperatures that occurred for the same period in the past years. So by using the sea surface uh, temperature global observation products of uh, CMEMS, you will be able to characterize the uh, areas in the Red Sea that are the most affected by a marine heat wave event occurring during the first week of June 2019. Then you will uh, cross correlate this information with the coral reef distribution in the Red Sea because the Red Sea is home to one of the most extended uh, coral reef system in the world. So by cross-correlating both information, you'll be able to identify um, the coral uh, reefs that needs to be checked in priority in order to assess how they cope with the current uh, marine heat wave phenomenon. So I would like to thank you for your attention and I remain uh, at your disposal for any questions you will have on Silo. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Uh, as he said, please uh, ask your question on Slido. Uh, I'm putting the link in the chat again. And right now we will have the presentation uh, uh, from Elena Di Medio. She is working at Mercator Ocean International as an education and training manager, and she will present you uh, the demo of Panoply. Uh, Elena, <coughs> the floor is yours. Thank you, Roman. Thank you, Simon, for the presentation. Hello, everyone. I'm Elena. As Roman said, I work at uh, the Copernicus Marine Service Desk. I'm here today to introduce you a uh, free software that allows to open and visualize NetCDF data. So with a graphical interface, we, so you don't have to, to use codes and script if you don't feel comfortable, you just need to, to get a a fast look to, to the data. So I'm going to share my screen. So we start. Now you should see it. Don't, uh, don't hesitate to tell me if you don't see uh, very well. So the free software is Panoply, has been developed and released by NASA, and it allows to uh, georeference arrays and multidimensional variables uh, from different formats. For us, the one we are interested in is the NetCDF as the format, the standard format for Copernicus Marine products. It's an application that runs in Macintosh, Windows, Linux, and other desktop computers. As I said, it's free of charges, so do not hesitate to, to download it if you want. I will show you today a small introduction with some basic functionality. So I'm gonna show you mostly how to geoplot reference longitude and long uh, latitude and longitude chart. So we will, we will make a map we, I will show you how to uh, plot a one array uh, variable and create a line plot. In this case, I can tell you already that it's going to be a time series for the temperature variable. And I will show you how to combine two different variables between them, and how to compare them, and finally, uh, how to save and export the, the data and the, the plot that we, we created together. He can be downloaded directly from the link here. The only requirements is the Java. So has to be updated or installed. So do not hesitate to install it. It's from this, uh, this official, uh, official page. Here you have all the, the options. And now we start with our, uh, with our example. 
Here, this is the main window. I already have my downloaded file, but I'm gonna show you first of all how to open an Atsidia file that already downloaded here in this case. The first thing is to click on file menu, open, and the window with all your folders will open on your PC and you will decide the folder where you, where you have your data and you will click and open the NetCDF file you want to visualize. In this case, it's always this, so nothing will change. Another option is directly from your folder. You can drag and drop the file. So if, for example, you, you have another that you already downloaded, you can drag and drop it in the, the main window. I'm not gonna do it otherwise. we are gonna mix everything, but it's an option. And here, once you have your, your NetCDF file available in the window, you will have two columns, two main categories. On the right here, you have the file name with the list of all the variables contained in our NetCDF file. And on the right, you have the name file, uh, the directory, and all the dimensions, variable informations, and at the end, if you scroll down, also the global attributes. So the title of the file of the sorry of the product, the conventions, the credits if you want to cite and reference the and share this data. <clears throat> sorry, and also our contact, just in case you you need to you have some question or or you need to contact us and speak with experts. So now that we have our file, I'm gonna show you first of all how to plot um, georeference data. So a classic map, a classic car chart of longitude and longitude. Here we can see I have three variables, eastward velocity, northward velocity. I also downloaded the temperature. I'm gonna start with the northward velocity. You will see why after I'm gonna uh, combine these two variables because these two are the directional component. I'm gonna try to, um, to visualize the directional gradient. So I'm gonna start with the northward velocity. I click on the variable. I click on create plot icon here. And this window will pop up where you have listed here all the plot that can be created for this variable. As I said, I want the classic map longitude latitude. I keep the red reference option and I click on create. So here we have our map for northward velocity where data uh, are missing. So for continents or so for all the rest of the oceans that I didn't download, the data are gray. So we can see that I focused on the south, on center South Africa. And we can see here that I have all my data from uh, minus 1.3 to 1.4 for northward velocity. Northward velocity is the, compo uh, the component, directional component from north to south. So we only have from north to south velocity for this variable. Here on the top, we can see that we have the array. So for every longitude and latitude point, grid, grid point, we have the values for our variable. So we can see already, we can have a first view of the variables. And here on the, on the right, we have the, average, the zonal average. If we come back to the plot, we can see here down that we have several tabs. These tabs help to customize our plot. For example, I start with the scale and come back after to the array tab. The first, uh, the first tab is the scale tab. This tab helps to, uh, to plot our data, our values. So I have first, uh, um, we can change the unit we can change so if i in this case by default it's uh, meters per second i can change in kilometers per hour or mile per hour depends on what you how you want to plot our data you can change the format i don't know why it appeared there uh, we can change the format we can also change the scale caption here by default is not word velocity but you can change and you can set the one you prefer for example i'm gonna put v zero 
and you can change the color tab if you want to to have different colors you can change also the field color so where you don't have data you can put another color it depends really how you want it darker or lighter and so on the map tab uh, it helps to change the projection if you want, for example, you're studying, uh, I don't know, Arctic data, you can change the projection and focus more on the Arctic and so on. You can also uh, zoom on the area of study. In this case, I'm gonna do it right now. I wanna focus on the south. Here I have, I click my on fixed proportions and I have my nice map. And the overlay tab, helps to add uh, up to two overlays uh, to geographical information that can be boundary countries, lakes uh, or coast, uh, also rivers, which can be interesting for some studies. I can also change the color if I want it more evident. The contour tabs allows to add the, the lines, the value lines. So for uh, in function of the uh, of the ranges, there is a, a line that appears uh, around the, that level of value. It can be interesting now, not really in this case for velocity, but can be very interesting for sea level data or even temperature and salinity data. So I'm gonna take it off, but it's an option that can be added. The vectors are tabs that will be activated later. I'm gonna show you in one minute when I will combine the, the other back, the other um, variable, sorry. And finally, we have the label tab, which, al which allows to change the title of the graphic here, add a subtitle if you want, a fo or footnotes on the left, on the right, or also change the, the font of our, uh, of, of, the, of the characters. And finally, the background. It depends how you want to show it, how to, you want to plot it. So it, it allows to do a lot of things to customize our plot. And the last tabs is the arrays. I keep it for last because it allows to play with the dimensions. So here we have the longitude and latitude that allows to create this map, this two, two dimensional map, but also have time and depth. In this case, I downloaded only surface data, but I can also have several levels of depth in function of what we ask in to download in NetCDF. So we can change that, or we can change the time and see the evolution of a variable along the time series. Here, for example, I have monthly data. It's monthly data over all over the year 2020, so last year. And I have done 12 steps. We can, um, we can advance through the time with three options or we click directly on the month we want to visualize. So we see that here the map change, we see here how the current become stronger. You can uh, directly write in the, uh, in the small window and click enter to come back to the time step we want or with the arrays of your keyboard, you can advance. And you see how the map adapts and changes in function of our time. So you can already have an idea of the evolution of the variable along the across the time. Now we have the Northworth velocity. I want to see also the uh, want to combine this variable to the eastward velocity and create then the gradient directional. So I click on the variable I want to combine. I click on combine plot and I choose my variable. In this case will be BO, so our not world velocity. Click on combine. We see then that the plot changed a bit. We can confirm it here. We have two arrays. The first array is that we saw before, which is uh, the not world velocity. And the second array that is for eastward velocity. Come back to the plot. Here in the arrays, we always have the option to change our dimensions, time, and depth, but we can also decide the calculation done between these two variables. 
now by default is array one minus array two. So the difference between these two variables which is not exactly what we need to, what we want to visualize. I can click and select the calculation. Here for current, I'm gonna choose vector magnitude. And here we have the, the plot that changes. We can see here the current, uh, the angular's current. Let's see, now it's more evident than, than before. And we also see small vectors. This is thanks to the vector lab that now mm, it's activated. So we can choose the vector if you want to add it or not. I choose to, yes, to, to show you uh, more visually what happened. I can change also the, the reference value, which is not very good here. I don't know if you see it well, so I'm gonna change it to 0 0.5. Maybe it's gonna be better. Yeah, we see the sum of them more clear. And the audio that we can cho cho choose also the, of course, the, the convention for the directions. Conventionally, um, the panoply already knows the right convention, but uh, can also uh, can always be a good a good option. In this case was in the in the other side. The other tabs stay the same, so you can always change our units and the range of values. You can change the the projection. Uh, you can add informations, change the title if you want to change the title. Maybe here can be interesting to change. See a water velocity. And, and so on. This is the first uh, first view. Once you obtain the, the data you want, the map you want, you can save the this image here on the file menu. You click on save image, or you can even choose the the format of the image. And it's also possible to export an animation. So you ask to Panoply to create a MP4 uh, video or JPEG frames, PNG frames, even TIFF frame, frames in function of the, um, the dimension you want that you could change in the arrays. We saw that depth uh, doesn't, I don't, I didn't download um several depth levels so we only have the surface it cannot be interesting but we can um create the the video along the the, the time so we will have 12 frames 12 front time steps i click on create and i save it i replace it and here we see how the animation is in progress we can see how the cart should yeah the cart is uh, adapting following the the time frame so here we are in february march and so on until the until december after i will have my p4 uh, video in the folder i decide to save it so you can always have access i'm gonna let it run here on a side and i'm gonna focus on the last thing i wanted to show you because i think we are running out of time um, here i want to show you now how to create a time series that's why i choose to download the, the temperature also maybe it would be more interesting the, that the current can be another example i have here my value my variable i click on the variable as before i click on create plot and i have here the same window uh, listing all the plots that can be created for this variable but in this case i want a line plot with the time on horizontal axis because the time series is the variable in this case uh, the temperature in function of the time. So I click on create and I have here my um, my temperature along the, the months for this point of longitude and land, of latitude and longitude. Here it did the average, it cannot also be the average, it changes. I can change this, uh, the grid point. I can see how it evolves. The same if I wanted to change the 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 deep level, but in this case I, I couldn't download more. 
So I see how the, the uh, how the, the temperature evolves um, in the time and also in function of the grid point. If I want here, for example, minus seven is not zero seven is not good enough. I want to change it. The x the um, the y axis. I change it here. Zero seven is not enough. I'm gonna say two should be better. Here we see the, so the, um, the evolution. I can change, as for the, the example before, I can change the format. So if I don't want it in this format, the time, I don't know why it appears there. <laughs> Sorry, it, uh, we can change it. So now, for example, I don't want the hour because it's, all, it's supposed to be always the same. So it's an average. So I take off the hour and only put the, the month, the year and the day like this. Uh, I can change the captions. X axis. If I want to, to put another one, I can I can change it. And I can also, if here, for example, I had the salinity, I could also add uh, another variable. It will be the salinity with the blue um, with a blue line to compare the two variables and see the maybe the relation between two, these two variables. And finally, we have the labels as always to, to change the title, subtitles, footnotes, and background if you want to save to change the background. And for last, this one also is possible to be saved, this plot. And for some data, you can also export the data in another format. So make a small conversion for in C CSV, CDL, or label text. So it depends how what you what you need, what you want to show. And I think we, <laughs> we are out of, uh, out of time. So uh, if you have any question, it was a just a small introduction. If you have any question, do not stay to contact us at the uh, Copernicus Marine Service Desk. There is also a YouTube video available on the Copernicus Marine YouTube channel. So it's another example, but the, the basic functionalities are the same with more time if you, if you want to spend more time on it. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Elena, for your very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we are now going to have a Q&A session, so I will ask all the lecturers that were there to switch on their cameras, please. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Paz, I think we are going to need your help too. <laughs> Um, so uh, we can start with the first uh, question, uh, which is how long will the information be available on the Padlet? Roman, you may want to answer. Yes, uh, the Padlet will be available for months, actually, like that we haven't put any expiration dates on the Padlet. So go ahead and use it uh, for any time you want. That's Thank it. you. <laughs> Uh, we can switch to the next next question. Um, are the L4 products good enough to use for publication complementary with other data depending on study? Uh, I think, Simon, you can answer because the exercise on QGIS, um, well, the products have been used in a real scientific study, right? Uh, yes, exactly. So I can at least reply for uh, the sea surface temperature global observation product. So these products are typically used for uh, studying marine heat wave phenomenon on scientific papers. So you're uh, free to use them, of course. And if I'm not wrong, uh, on for the level four products uh, containing remote sensing and in-situ data combined, at least for the sea surface temperature, it's only from space. So uh, space-based uh, observations. I think uh, the Chlorophyll, it's the same as well. The ocean uh, color products, it's only uh, based on uh, uh, space-borne uh, technology. But yes, uh, it's uh, totally usable for um, scientific studies. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, the next question is, can you not use my ocean viewer to do what Panoply does? Uh, yes, maybe perhaps Lina I can answer. Or... 
Yeah, if you want Fabrice, you yeah you can. Yes, of course you can use Myation Viewer from some uh, similar functionalities, but if you want to. Uh, if you want to make some um, simple operations, as uh, uh, Elena uh, Elena has shown, um, it's better to use Panoply. But the viewer is uh, uh, we continue to to uh, improve the the Myosian viewer. So you have um, day after day new uh, new functionalities, very useful for for beginner people and to make uh, some relevant. Uh, diagrams or maps. Okay, uh, thank you for this answer. We're going to have one last uh, question and the rest of the questions will be answered in uh, a separate file that will be sent to you and uh, the same way that uh, we did for yesterday and the answers are available in the Padlet. So the last question is, hi Elena, can we export maps in shape files? Thank you. Yeah, there is an option. I didn't show it because I didn't have time. Uh, it's an option that allows to convert, to export the data you are looking at into KML date, KML format, which is similar to as uh, as uh, HP. So you can you can add it to to a, a GIS software if you want, so Arc, uh, ArcGIS or even Google Maps, or Google uh, Google Earth can open it. So yeah, there is an option that I able to, to do that, that is able. Thank you. And maybe one last answer, uh, Roman, yes. you wanted? Yeah, I just want to address this question to have uh, the contact info of other participants. And on that, I would advise you, if you want to leave your contact info, to put that on your pin on the world map that we are sharing. So everyone that will, to, will like to post their info there should, and then it will be accessible to everyone uh, participating in this workshop. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> so go ahead on the map. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, so this is the end of this uh, Q&A session. Again, uh, all the other questions will be answered uh, in uh, the Padlet. You'll have the answers in the Padlet. Uh, because we are running out of time, uh, we're a little late, so we will only have a five-minute break. And so we will be back at, uh, well, at 11. That's okay.
Welcome back, everyone. So let's uh, start uh, with um, the part two of our workshop. Before giving the floor to our next speaker, I just want to show you quickly um, how to register to uh, Copernicus because uh, you were wondering that question and it came up a lot. So when you are in Marine Copernicus website on the, web, on the homepage, you click here to register and then it's just a quick form with simple question you accept and you create your account and i just want to highlight again that it's free to register and the data is free as well that's it um now so the part two i want to welcome ergan fouché um from novelties our moderator that now will present you uh, the jupyter notebook demo and uh, will guide you towards your first step using a uh, jupyter notebook so again, the floor is yours. I'm stopping my screen sharing. Uh, thank you, Roman. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, so as Roman said, I'm going to present you uh, some of the Jupyter notebooks that we have prepared for this workshop. Uh, these are the notebooks that, I, that uh, Simon presented before. Uh, unfortunately, I won't have time to go through all the exercises. Uh, I know some of you were interested in some specific exercise, but um, as I said before, uh, each notebook goes with a video uh, and the videos are very complete and, it, and they explain very well what, uh, what the notebooks do. So if you're interested in a specific notebook, you can um, have a look at the videos or just scroll the notebooks and you will find all the information you need uh, on the phenomena that you're interested in. Um, so I'm going to start with the introduction. Um, so you can see here on the Jupyter Hub that I am in the shared notebooks uh, and in Training Africa for, uh, in this folder. Uh, I'm going to work directly from here, but remember that if you want to do it, uh, you have to copy um the the directories into your own space just like fabrice mentioned before and to do so you can find all the information on the padlet so i'm starting with the introduction uh, just a reminder that this is how a jupyter notebook looks like uh, it's very easy even for beginners um, so you can see that you have uh, figures you have text and uh, if we go below you can see we have a uh, code these are python code uh, and so thanks to this uh, jupyter notebook we can um, we can uh, have the whole exercise uh, so this introduction notebook um, in the first section you will learn how to download the data but i don't want to spend too much time on this uh, on this section so uh, the first um, method presented is uh, through the catalog. So this is what has been presented uh, during the webinar. Um, and here you can find the tutorial videos uh, that explain how to download the, um, uh, the products. You can also download the Copernicus Marine Service products uh, directly from Python, thanks to the Machu client. And um, so again, you have a dedicated, a dedicated web page here, and uh, on the video associated to the um, to the introduction notebook, uh, it's very well explained how you can use Python to download the, with the Matu client. Uh, what I want to show you in this session is how to handle NetCDF files with Python. Um, so to do so, we're going to use the library XArray. Uh, it's very, it's widely used, it's very user friendly, very convenient, very easy to use. Um, here you have the link to the, um, to the library documentation and on the internet you have plenty of examples on forums, etc. Uh, that will show you um, how to use this uh, library. So the first step uh, in Python is to import the libraries you need. Um, so you can click on the arrows here or use the keyboard shortcuts, shift and enter. So that's what I did. And so now that we have uh, imported the library, we can start exploring the NetCDF file content. 
Um, all the data that we are going to use in all the notebooks, they have already been downloaded and they are located in the data folder here. You can see that we have our NetCDF file because uh, all the um, products from the Copernicus Marine Service, they are distributed in NetCDF file. Um, uh, and so the first step to study the file that we have here in the data folder is to define the path to this file. So this is the variable we are defining, and this is the path to the, to the file. So we run this cell, um, and then we are going to see the content of this file. So we are using it to the file. And then you just have, so we create a new variable with um, that we call mod fee, uh, that refers to the physical model. And if you just uh, run the name of your Python variable into a cell, uh, then all the content of the file would, will be displayed. And, uh, and so here we run the cell and you can see all the information you need about your file. So as it has been presented before, NetCDF files have uh, dimensions, coordinates, variables, and attributes. Um, you can see here that the coordinates are depth, latitude, time, and longitude, and that you have several variables. If you want to learn about uh, one variable, let's take uh, this one, the tau, for example. Here you have a show hide attributes uh, button. And if you click on it, you can find uh, the information on the um, on the variables. So you can see that the tau refers to the temperature, that its units are Celsius degrees, um, and that uh, its coordinates are time, depth, latitude, and longitude. So this means that um, for each date, each depth, each latitude, and each longitude, you will have a temperature value. Um, then in the notebook, you can find several ways to have a list of the variables, the coordinates, the dimensions, etc. But um, the easiest way to get all this information is just by putting the name of your variable into a cell and running it, and you will find uh, everything you need. So I'm um, switching to another section. Uh, what you're going to need most is uh, to check and store the variables. So for example, if we're interested in the temperature, we have seen before that uh, the temperature was stored uh, under the variable theta in the modfi dataset. And so if you, you just have to put the name of your variables between brackets, and then you will have the information uh, you need. So um, this, uh, the temperature uh, will be used as a 4D array. So because we have four dimensions and then you can use uh, this variable just like you would do for a numpy variable, for example. Um, so that's it for the introduction notebook. I will now go to the first exercise. Uh, I'm going to show you some part of the, the upwelling exercise. Um, the aim of uh, this presentation uh, and this notebook are to, to give you uh, some examples of code that you can uh, adapt and uh, reuse to, to produce your own studies. Um, and you also, of course, uh, we are also explaining you some of the, the ocean phenomena that occur uh, along the African coasts. But um, um, we want to provide you uh, already made code, codes that you can uh, reuse for your own purposes. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, upwellings. So Simon has explained it before, but uh, here is a figure that describes the phenomenon. So when the winds blow alongside the coastline, then it chases away the water from the ocean surface. And then the, um, the water from the deep ocean rises up to take its place. Uh, the water from the deep ocean is colder and it's also nutrient rich. And so when these waters uh, reaches the surface, then the surface water becomes colder and nutrient rich. 
the nutrients, they are the very base of the ocean food chain. And so uh, when you have nutrients, you have phytoplankton, then you have zooplankton, then you have fish, and then you have fishermen. And so just like Simon said before, um, uh, we are going to explain you why in the regions uh, where upwellings happen, why uh, these regions are uh, usually uh, regions with very intense fishery activities. Um, so now that we have explained the phenomenon, we can, um, we can start using the Copernicus marine products to observe it. So we are going to study four parameters. So the wind, because that's what generates the upwelling. Um, to see that the surface temperature actually decreases thanks to the upwelling. We're going to see, to observe the nitrate, uh, which is some of the nutrients uh, that come from the deep ocean. And finally, we're going to study the chlorophyll because uh, the phytoplankton uses chlorophyll to carry out photosynthesis. And so the more phytoplankton, the more chlorophyll. This is the region that we are going to study. So the Mauritanian coast, especially. And we're going to study um, upwellings from May to June 2021. The products that we are going to use are the wind observation, the physical model, and the biogeochemical models. Uh, in the video uh, associated to this uh, notebook, you can find uh, more information on these models and, uh, well, these products. Um, the, these products have also been described um, quite completely during the first workshop session. So you can have a look at the videos on the Padlet to learn about uh, these uh, products. And so now we can begin to use Python to observe the upwelling. So the libraries that we are going to use are the following ones. So the first one is NumPy, which is a very, very basic library used for scientific computing. Uh, we're going to use XArray, the library that I have presented before. We're going to use Matplotlib. Again, it's a very basic uh, Python library to, to produce uh, figures. And finally, we're going to use Cartopy. Uh, which is a library used for maps and, the, and geospatial analysis. Um, so again, we import the libraries. Um, just like for XRA, you have the links to the library's documentation on the notebook. And also because these libraries are very widely used, you have plenty of examples on the internet if you want to uh, make your own uh, plots. <clears throat> um, so again, the first uh, step will be to define the path to the um, to the files. They are stored here. If you go to the upwelling folder, they are stored in the data folder. So we are going to have three data sets: the physical model, the bio model, and the wind observations. So we run this cell. We remember that if we want to check on the products dimensions and names, we just have to, um, to run the name of the variable in a cell. So here for the bio model, we can see that we have um, here, for example, the nitrate and that its dimensions are uh, time, depth, latitude and longitude. Um, if we change and if we want to see what's in the wind, uh, we run the wind data set and we can see that here the, the coordinates are long time and lat. We can see we have no depth coordinate here. Um, and that's it for the product presentation. We can begin to plot uh, our figures. Um, so here is the first figure that we are going to, to make. It shows the evolution of the the wind speed and the wind direction. In the background, um, you have the wind speed and uh, the arrows, they refer to, um, to the wind direction. So you have a map for each day 
So you have nine days represented. And this figure will help us identify the regions and periods where we are likely to observe an, an upwelling. Um, so here is how uh, this figure has been constructed. Um, I'm not going to explain you each line uh, because uh, there are many comments in the code and also uh, the code is described in the videos uh, that goes with this uh, notebook. But what you may want to know is that uh, we are using the matplotlib uh, functions picolor to plot the background. So the reds, uh, the reds in the background. Background, the function quiver to put the vectors that represent the wind direction. Um, you can see here that we are calling just like we learned before the wind speed variable from uh, from the wind uh, and uh, the wind direction, so eastward wind, northward wind, etc. Uh, what's interesting as well, a very useful uh, function with the X-ray files is the dot cell function. So here you can see that we define a date and then you just have to, to put dot cell uh, time equals date and then you will select the date that you're interested in. So this is how we build uh, the nine um, figures, the nine maps for each date. What you can change uh, is the min and max values of the color bar. So you can see here that it goes from zero to 14. Um, you can change these values if you want. You can also change the, the color map. Uh, here it's red, but if you put blues, uh, then you'll have the, the same figure but in blue. Um, so that's it for the, um, for the wind maps. Uh, in the notebooks, you have several exercises. Here we propose you to reproduce this figure with other products and other parameters. So the surface temperature, nutrients, etc. And um, the next thing I want to show you is the, um, the time series. So we are going to study the correlation between uh, the parameters. So the wind, the temperature, the nitrate, and the chlorophyll, thanks to time series. The first step to do so is to define the coordinates of one point we want to study. So we defined its coordinates, the longitude, latitude, and depth. We take the depth to zero because where we want to see the surface uh, parameters. And then just like we did before, we're going to select, to subset our data sets, um, selecting the longitude, latitude, and depth um, of the point that we have defined. So we create three new uh, data set at the point. And then we will be able to uh, plot the time series to, um, the time series of the parameters at this point. So um, to do so, we are using the dot plot uh, function from matplotlib. So we will plot the wind, the sea surface temperature, the nitrate, and the chlorophyll. And on the top, we will add a map with the location of the point we're studying. Um, sorry. <laughs> So we run the cells and um, you can see here that we have the map, uh, the location of the, the point we are studying. And you can see the time series uh, of the parameters. What's interesting to see from this figure is that uh, the wind rose um, about the 7th of June. And then as a result, the temperature decreased and the nitrate increased. That's because the water from the deep ocean rose to the surface. And we can see that a few days later, uh, the chlorophyll bloom and that uh, we can see that the chlorophyll increased. And that, that's because uh, phytoplankton developed. Um, in the next sections, we plot several other figures and animations, but uh, I won't have time to show you everything. Uh, the only thing I would like to show you is um, the map of uh, that shows the location uh, right now of the ships. So if you click here on the link, 
Um, here you can see the fishing ships and you can see that indeed uh, along the Mauritanian coast, you have many fish boats, many fishermen, uh, because the upwelling regions uh, provide very uh, rich uh, marine wildlife. So I hope uh, you were interested in this notebook. Again, there are other exercises about river discharge uh, and cyclones. And uh, these notebooks go vi with video uh, that explain the, the phenomena and that show very interesting plots. And so if you have any question, you can contact us. Um, we will answer well, your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Ergan. And now we will, um, I, I just want to say for your question, you can also, again, go on Slido because we will have another Q&A session after uh, the, all the speakers from the part two. And now I want to invite Paz Roland Garcia for the next uh, um, intervention. She's trainer and front-end developer at SOCIB, and she will uh, present you uh, the Jupyter Notebook for the Institute data. Paz, are you around? Yes. The floor I'm is yours. Trying. Yes. I was trying to share the screen, but I cannot because it's okay. Thank now you. Now you should be able. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Can you see the Jupyter notebook? Yes. Yes, you okay. can see your screen. Okay. Well, uh, as uh, you were already told, I'm here to present the training material uh, that I developed uh, for the in-situ uh, observation that are available in the Copernicus Marine Service. You can always run this notebook later, as I was telling through the chat, because I have already uh, uh, provided a video support uh, for this notebook. So even if we don't have uh, time enough for completing the notebook, uh, please just visit the video because in the video you, you find the explanation for the whole the whole notebook, okay? Um, I just would like to, to start by uh, um, explaining that we are uh, about to, to, to deal with in situ observations, with, which are the data reported by a wide range of platforms, like the ones you can see here, that are deployed in the ocean. Um, in order to measure certain variables like temperature, salinity, uh, velocity, and, and, and so on. Uh, so this is a, uh, the, the resulting product is a completely dif different uh, product than the ones you have seen so far, which are uh, uh, regular uh, grids uh, uh, that are outputted by models or uh, satellite observations. Okay, so in this case, we are dealing with a completely different set of data. Although you will see that with the service we are going to use, which is the uh, recently uh, published AirDAP service, it will be very, very friendly to, to work with this kind of data, okay? Um, as, I, as I just told you, we are going to, to use the AirDAP service to, to find in situ data um, and to, to, to make some job with it, uh, make some plots. Um, uh, and we are going to use the, 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 the AirDAP service, but this service is, is limited to the last 30 days of data uh, regarding in situ observations. So in case you want older, older data, you should use the FTP service, okay? And this is why I provide this link in here, uh, because in this link you will find uh, uh, the, uh, the America continent material that I prepared, focusing on how to use the FTP service for uh, finding, downloading, and plotting the, uh, sorry, for finding and downloading the in situ data, okay? Uh, so just if you want uh, all their data, just visit this link, okay? It, even though it was prepared for the American continent, you can always specify any other area, not necessarily in the American con continent. Um, okay, so let's, let's go to the, to the, let's go to start. And as you have seen uh, before, the first thing is to import the, the libraries, okay? Um, the second thing is to import other auxiliary functions that you might have prepared. In this, case, uh, in this case, I prepared some auxiliary functions in the lib directory, okay? And it's, it's because it, we are going to use some of these functions later, so we need to, to import them. Of course, you can revisit these uh, functions 
and and customize them according to to your needs. Okay, uh, um, what I, I just provided was a, a very humble um, example of of uh, functions that are, are are worth it import because it's going to smooth things uh, onwards. Okay, but again, it's important to import them because we are going to to use them later. And the second thing we are going to to do is to uh, um, set the search con constraints, okay? In, in the end, we are going to uh, look for data in, a, in, in, our, in an area of interest and also in a time range of interest. And we are going to look for data uh, uh, tackling a certain uh, parameter like temperature, salinity, and so on. So our objective in this step is to specify all of these search conditions, okay? Or search constraints. And the first step, as I was telling you, is to set the area of interest. You have to, to set uh, the, the corners of a rectangle, and we are going to search the data within that uh, rectangle or boundary box. Okay, I have set this one that you, that you can preview here, which is uh, nearby the Cabo Verde uh, Islands, but you can, of course, uh, set a different one. Okay, it's a matter of setting uh, a different bounding box. Okay, so uh, this is going to be our area of interest for searching in situ data. Okay, but again, feel free to, to set a different one. And it's going to work for whatever the part in the world, not only for, for, for Africa. Okay, so just feel free of changing it to, to whatever the place. And then we are going to set um, a range of time for looking for data. I have put this start, starting and end date, but again, you can set your own. Okay, remember that again, this service is only available for the last 30 days on data. So don't ask, don't ask for data in 2016, because in this case, you are not going to find anything, okay? In that case, again, please visit the material for the FTP uh, service, and you will see how to do a similar exercise, because I also uh, I have also prepared a similar exercise for FTP service, okay? And then we are going to, to set also the uh, depth range of interest, because uh, maybe we are uh, interested in, uh, in, in, in a specific range of, of depth. Um, and, and therefore, I have uh, set here from zero to 100 uh, meters. But again, you can uh, change this. Maybe you are only interested in surface data. So it's, uh, you just have to set zero to zero. OK, but I'm going to leave it uh, like that. Um, uh, customize this, of course and uh, rerun this again according to your, to your needs. And then uh, we are going to set the parameter of interest. In this case, I have set the temperature, but you can, of course, set a different parameter. The list of parameters is in this link I have provided here, okay? You will find in this link a code for every parameter, okay? So you have also, for example, the uh, PSAL for the salinity, also, um, I don't know, the, the ATM for the uh, pressure, the atmosphere, uh, atmospheric pressure, and so on. Okay, so just visit the link, and you will find in there more uh, parameter codes to put in here, okay, and search this, this parameter in particular. And then we are going to set uh, the source of interest, okay? Remember that the source is basically the instrument and platform that is reporting the data. We might want uh, temperature in the Cabo uh, Verde uh, area in the time range of interest that we have put and also in the depth of interest we have put, but we might also want to specify the source of this uh, temperature data. And in this case, I have selected the drifting wall, which is the, the code we are seeing here. The DV stands for drifting wall. Again, I have provided here a link for you to visit all the codes referring to the different uh, sources that are providing data to the to the in situ uh, observations uh, observational products in the Copernicus Marine Service. So you will be able to specify a different one, like profilers, gliders, and so on. Okay, there are uh, many different codes that you can also uh, select and, and 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 follow and, and keep on going. Then uh, we are going to to, ask, to start the part of data discovery, where we just create a dictionary with all the, the constraints we have already established for the searching. And then we are going to make the request to ERDAP to get this data. This is the, link, the link that we have generated for finding the, the data according to our constraint. Indeed, if you click on the link, can you see this? Because now I don't know if, we, if I'm sharing the screen or only the, the tab. We can see it. Okay, thank you. So in here you have the preview of the results, 
uh, of the data you, you, have, uh, you are looking for, okay? So basically we have phone temperature data because this was uh, what we were aiming in the, in the area of interest and the time range, uh, time depth, of, sorry, and, and the depth of interest. Um, and uh, no, another important thing to, to look in here is that you have the uh, temperature QC. The temperature QC is the quality uh, control flag over the temperature values, okay? The good part of the in-situ observation available in the Copernicus Marine Service is that uh, you are not only going to find the values, but you are going to find also a, a reliability indicator over uh, for each of the values. So for example, uh, one means that the value uh, linked to the, the corresponding observing value is uh, considered to be good, a good value, okay? And we have a table uh, for these codes also in the um, in here in the in the tips uh, notebook i have provided a, a table with all the the codes uh, relative to the quality flags okay so you know that one means good data two probably good data and three potentially correctable data four bad data and so on the idea or the recommendation is to work only with good and probably good data okay so uh, uh, regarding the, the reply, you will always uh, want to filter uh, the, the, the overall reply by a third, to keep only uh, the data flag as one or two. Okay, this is uh, the recommendation, and we will be, we will do this uh, later. Then uh, what we are going to do is to export all this information to a pandas data frame because it's going to enable us to, to make some further checking or uh, summary about what we, uh, we have obtained. obtained. And this is what we do with one of the auxiliary functions called uh, response request to data frame that I, I coded in the uh, lead uh, folder that I showed you before in here, okay? So this is uh, why it was important to, to import those, those auxiliary functions. And then uh, we are going to have again a preview of the results, but uh, as a pandas data frame. It's taking a little bit because it's converting the HTML uh, table that we saw before to a pandas data frame, but uh, in the end we managed to have it. Um, in here you have a summary of the uh, columns of the content of the of the different columns we have in the in the pandas data frame, and in here you have an overview of the 10 first line. Okay, again matching what we have already seen in the HTML table that we saw before. And then I have prepared some uh, nice plots to make a uh, to get some insight about the uh, uh, subset we have found according to our search constraints. Okay, so it's a matter of running this in Excel uh, that responds to certain uh, questions like what's the spatial resolution of the of observation observation founds, no? And then uh, we build a map a map with this observation, and we can see how they are uh, distributed. Okay, so we have found all these. Uh, temperature uh, observation from uh, drifters in the uh, Cabo Verde uh, Islands uh, area, okay? And then uh, we are going to ask ourselves again, um, what, what is the temporal distribution of these uh, observations, no? And then we are going to be able to create a calendar map, uh, also with a color bar, for example, to be able to see what's the uh, abundance of observation per day uh, in our request, okay? And we can see that most of the observation concentrates in the in the latest uh, uh, in the last uh, last date of November and the first date of, of December, okay? While there are very few at the beginning of the of the month, so it's also useful uh, this kind of observation to to have a glimpse about the results. Then the next plot we are going to build. Is, the, uh, is to uh, have a look about the amount of platforms that are contributing with data to the set we have found, okay? And this is what we do here. We have a code per platform and the number of observations they have contributed uh, with, okay? And uh, we have also uh, per platform uh, colored, um, sorry, we have the detail uh, per platform of the owner of the, of the different platforms. Uh, most of them are unknown, this happened a lot with the drifters, but um, for some other we have, uh, we know the provider and we, uh, of course, uh, highlight this with an identifier, the CData Net identifier, which is called uh, Edmo code, okay? So for example, for uh, the, these two uh, drifters, the owner is this one, okay? And for these other two, the owner is this one. And who is uh, this uh, uh, behind this digit? Well, you can, you can always visit CData Net, and, and, and request information uh, using this service 
um, for example, for the uh, um, 1390 uh, is, is the scripts institution of oceanography. Okay, this is the one providing those drifters. And this is the way you, you can have a look about the uh, providers uh, in your set and also the platform in your set. In your set. Another thing we are going to do is, uh, of course, to check the overall quality flags on the observations. And as we can see, most of the data is flagged as one. And for uh, other data, uh, you can find that uh, you, you find no flag. Um, um, when the flag is not available, it's because the data is, is uh, an an, okay? The, if the observation is an an, the flag is an an too. So this is the situation. It's not a bad situation because when we have a value, uh, uh, is, it, is, it is flagged as, as good, okay? So it's not uh, a bad situation at all. And then another thing we are going to want to do is to see the distribution of the different observation uh, per depth level, because if you remember, we, have, uh, we are searching from zero to 100 uh, meters. And in this case, in the area of interest and so on, uh, we have found um, uh, temperature values associated with uh, the surface, but also with near the surface, uh, 0 0.5 uh, meters, and also uh, 15 meters uh, depth. Okay, so it's, it's again a, a, a way to have a quick uh, look about the uh, resulting uh, set. And then um, we are going to perform just the data download uh, by specify, uh, specifying a file name. Again, uh, by specifying also a file format. I'm going to export this to a CSV format, but you can export it to several other formats, like, uh, I don't know, uh, for example, uh, GeoJSON or, it, uh, or whatever other format, NetDF, for example, that you want, because the data service uh, is, is, is able to, to provide any format you, you want. And then uh, by triggering the last cell, you basically perform the download and you have it here exactly the same uh, that we saw in the HTML table uh, as a CSV file, okay? Again, the coordinates of each um, observation and the uh, uh, observations and the quality flags of these observations so that you can work with it uh, later. I don't know if I'm good with time, but uh, uh, let me know if, if I'm, uh, I am not and I stop. Um, in the data plotting part, the idea is to uh, basically uh, plot the, the, the data coming from a specific platform. So we randomly uh, work with the platform number seven, which is this one, okay? This is the code of the, of the platform. And we are going to, to plot solely the data coming from this platform, which is uh, this one. Um, I have to move this, okay. You can, of course, zoom in and zoom out to visualize this uh, better. We are using Plotly, Plotly Express library in Python, which is quite uh, nice because it's interactive. Um, and then uh, we, are we are seeing that uh, most of this uh, data uh, from temperature uh, is, is an and, uh, there is no value. And then we are going to, to, to only um, to filter all this data by using the quality flags. We are going to keep only the data flag as one and two, and we will see how we uh, can reproduce this uh, um, plot by uh, removing those uh, uh, none values. Okay, so we have in here again the plot without the none values. And then what we are going to, to do is to basically um, 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 animate this. Uh, this plot, okay? We are going to see the evolution of the uh, mes measurements in time. And this is uh, something that provides the Plotly Express uh, library that you can always animate the, 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 resulting, the resulting plot, okay? By playing here, you will see how the dot moves over time. And uh, it, it, it is basically the evolution of the, of the trajectory we were seeing. Uh, we are going to do this also with the 3D chart we are going to see next but it's, it's quite similar. And then uh, we are going to do the same, but uh, as a time series, okay? No matter the, the place, we, we are going to, to see how the uh, time, the temperature evolves in time. Uh, um, the temperature reported by the specific, specific platform evolves in time. And as we can see, it goes down uh, until uh, the, last, the very last uh, data with a little bit of, with a little peak in here in the middle, okay? 
And then uh, we are going to, to build uh, the same uh, time series plot by differentiating, uh, um, by coloring it per depth, because as we saw before, some of the platforms are reporting temperature data in different depths, not only one. In this case, in the, the one we, we, cho we chose, uh, we only have uh, the temperature de data associated with the 0 0.5 meters, okay? But in other cases, uh, you will find more depths uh, listed in here, and of course, more uh, the temperature uh, uh, colored in different, in different colors, okay? Uh, corresponding to the different depths. And then, uh, again, uh, is a matter plot in the same, but as a 3D plot, okay? Where you can actually see in depth the, the, the trajectory. Again, this is going to be more visual if you have more than one depth. It's not the case of our example, but here you have it. And to finalize, it's just a matter of building for this 3D chart, again, an animation uh, with the plot express library that uh, works the same as we saw before with, uh, pro by providing a play button where you can actually see the evolution of the uh, temperature data, okay? And um, that was all for the institute data. I would like you to, to try it. Uh, by cust customizing the, the, the search constraint so that you can actually uh, search on, on your area of interest and, and so on uh, for, for the data you want to, to discover. Um, thank you very much. Uh, sorry. Thank you very much, Paz. Your notebooks are always very interesting and the plots you make, uh, well, I really love them. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we will now give the floor to our last lecturer, Etienne Sauk, a colleague of mine uh, from Noveltis. He's a Notion engineer as well, and he's going to show you a QGIS demo on the exercises that have been presented before. Hi, Etienne. The floor. Hi, again. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Now we can start. So, hello, everybody. And today I'm going to show you a short exhibition on the training on how to uh, to deal with uh, sailing conditions using the free software uh, QGIS. Uh, as you may know, the seas of the Southern African coastline lie amongst the most dangerous places to sail. Uh, this region is particularly proof to maritime disasters, strong winds, and poor full surface uh, currents. Again, we are not seeing your screen, I think. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, okay. Yes, I think thank it's you very better much. Now. <laughs> so, this region, uh, the South uh, African coastline, is particularly prone uh, to maritime disasters, strong winds powerful surface currents and freak uh, waves. And these events can cause economic and environmental uh, uh, casualties, commodity or life loss and black tides. So in this training, we are going to see how to use Copernicus Marine Service products of waves and currents uh, to determine uh, safety uh, route, uh, safe route uh, in this uh, maritime area uh, using the QGIS software. Noveltis has developed a plugin to deal with the NetCDF data from the Copernicus Marine Service that you can download on the user uh, uh, material uh, in the Copernicus Marine Service. And here we are using uh, analysis model uh, at the 1 12th degrees resolution uh, for, uh, for waves and currents uh, uh, for February and July. We are using mean currents on a monthly uh, time scale, and we are using three hour base basis uh, wave uh, data. Uh, in uh, this short exhibition, I will only focus on conditions on uh, the month of July corresponding to the austral winter with the harshest uh, conditions. So here in the in the QGIS uh, software, you can once installed, uh, open the NetCDF 2GIS uh, plugin here. And we are going to load the NetCDF data uh, containing the monthly mean uh, of each component of the current field uh, for the month of July. Once it is selected, you can open it in the plugin. Uh, 
And here you have access to several information, the variables uh, contained in the, the data downloaded from the Copernicus Marine Service, U0 and V0 corresponding to the eastward and northward seawater velocity. And you have also access to units, dimensions, and metadata. Here you have the resolution of your data and a lot of uh, global attributes from the Copernicus Marine Service. First of all, as we did, uh, you can see on the video available on the Copernicus Marine Service website, uh, we did this before for the month of February, and I'm going to do it and show you how to do uh, for the month of uh, July. First of all, we are going to load the components of the current field for the month of July, uh, the eastward and northward component, and then we are going to compute the current vector field around uh, South African coast. First of all, uh, you can select the first variable, the eastward component uh, of add layers to add this uh, component to your QGIS project. Here we have only one date and one depth, so we don't have to select any of these. And we just have to uncheck the override group to keep our data for February and add our data for July. You can select add and close. We are going to do the same. So you can see that the eastward component of the current vector field in July have been added to your background. Now we are going to do the same with the northward component. So right click on it, add layers and select and check the override group option. Click on add and close. Again, you have the northward uh, velocity layer added to your background. Now we are going to go to the layers panel here of the plugin, and we are going to compute the vector field of oceanic currents, uh, combining eastward and northward components. To do so, you can select the eastward component here, U0, press control on your keyboard, select the V0 component corresponding to the northward seawater velocity, and right click on the two layers and select the function vectorize to compute a vector field of currents. Here, another uh, dialog box opens, and here we are going to select how to compute this vector field. We are going to use a UV components, the eastward and northward seawater velocity. At the U component, you select the U0 uh, for the months of July. And as V component, you select the V0 for the month of July. Here, you can select the norm of projection of the vector field. So we are going to select the current norm to have uh, a vector field in the, the good direction. And here we are going to apply a done sampling, which is a vector uh, in order to reduce the number of arrows uh, in the final representation. It's going to be clearer on our maps, and we are going to select only one out of three arrows uh, on our NetCDF data. Then you can just select an output directory and give the resulting layer the name current field for July 2021 and click on vectorize. Now you can close this window, reduce the NetCDF to GIS plugin window and here you can see on the vector group here, if you activate this group, that the vector field of currents for the months of July have been uh, displayed on your QGIS project. Here I'm going to just hide the V0 and U0 components to only show the vector field currents. So here you can see that we have uh, maximums of uh, oceanic currents 
along the South African coast here, representing the Aguas current. Now we are just going to apply a new style to this uh, rose to have uh, steps with, uh, with uh, uh, an already set uh, style. To do so, right click on your layer, open the properties, make take some time okay and now you can go on the bottom here to style and load style we are going to load a, a style from file and you can browse on your directories and take this current scale dot qml which is a, a style file uh, provided with the user manual of this training you can open it click on load style and apply. Now we have values of arrows from zero to two meter per second with these steps. Click on okay. So now we can clearly see that we have the Aguas current represented here along the South African coastline. In the second step of this training, we are going to open again the NetCDF to GIS uh, plugin and open uh, wave uh, fields. We are going to represent the wave field during the first days of the month of July and compare the current field along the South African coastline with the wave field. Click on plus to open and import a new NetCDF uh, file go to the directory containing uh, your data and we are going to import the analysis uh, model forecast product of waves for the month of july click on open now if you select the second uh, file you have access to the variable of significant wave height vhmo here in meters with a resolution of 112 degrees. Now we are going to uh, quickly uh, show an animation of uh, this layer and uh, of this variable a long time. To do so, there is a particular function on the NetCDF to GIS plugin, which is sequence layers. Right click on the variable you want to animate, select sequence layers, and here, we are going to display layers from the 2nd of July to the 4th of July, for example. So to, do, to select these layers, you can select the first one, press Shift on your keyboard, go to the last time frame you want to display, and click on it. Now we are going to rename the resulting group to sequence July, and we are going to display for each uh, time step of the animation, the minimum and maximum values for each layer. Then you can launch start to display the animation. You can, for example, reduce your two panels, and you can see here that we have all the layers scrolling from the 2nd to the 5th of July in 2021 with minimum and maximum values of each layer. Now we will focus, you can stop the animation, close it, and just focus on the 3rd of July at 9 PA. So activate this layer and just uncheck the other one. We are going to just tune the representation of this layer to highlight maximum values of significant wave height on the 3rd of July, 2021. Right click on the layer, go to properties. And here you have the properties panel opening. We are going to set the minimum uh, significant wave height to two meters and the maximum one to nine. Here, be careful and set the color ramp from blue for minimum values to red for maximum values. 
and click on apply and OK. So here we can see that we have highlighted maximum values of significant wave height along the South African coast. What you can do is just copy the style of this layer, right click on it, go to style and copy style and apply it to all the other layers. With doing that, you have just applied, if you select the properties of another layer, the same minimum and maximum values and color range. OK, now we are going to compare the significant wave height field on the 3rd of July 2021 with the current field of the mean current field on the month of July. If we drag the vector field on top of the significant wave height field, sequence July and 3rd of July here, we can see that we have a concomitance between the, the maximum of the current field here with the arrows in red, representing the aqueous current, and in the background, with the significant wave height maximum values. So we have uh, hard conditions uh, for sailing in this area uh, along the South African coastline. So we are going to import data from the World Port Index, which is a global database which provides harbor locations around the world. And we are going to try to display and draw a route avoiding uh, high, uh, max, uh, high significant wave height uh, values here and benefiting from the high uh, current uh, values with the arrows here. To do so, we are going to open layer and select add layers. And we are going to add a vector layer because the uh, world bot index shape file gathering all the arbors in the world is a vector layer. We can browse in our directories select the world port index dot shape file here and click on open and add. Then you can close. You can just drag this layer world port index on top of all the layers. As you can see here, we have several green dots along the South African coast, but also everywhere in the world. And we are going to filter this data to only keep our boards in South Africa. Right click on the WPI layer and select filter. We are going to filter by country. Double click on country here. And we are going to select only our boards in South Africa, which has an index ZA. You can click on tests. And there are eight hours remaining. OK and OK. Now we are going to apply a new style to these arbors according to their size and location. To do so, right click on this layer, going to properties. And we are going to load a, a file of style corresponding to the size of each arbor. Very small, small, medium, and large. Go to style, load style. And here we are going to browse again a style file. You can go to the style WPI size.qml, which is provided with the user manual of this training. Click on open and load style. Here you can see that we have several dots and colors corresponding to very small, small, medium, and large arbor size. You can click on apply and OK. So here, if we deactivate the vector, uh, the current field, and the significant wave height layer, we can see that we have the name of 
each harbor of the South African coastline. We are now going to draw a route between the Durban Harbor and the Cape Town Harbor, uh, trying to avoid uh, significant wave height maximum and benefiting from high current uh, speed here. To do so, uh, create a new shapefile layer here with this icon. And we are going to give it a name. So I'm going to call it Safe Shipping Points Durban Cape Town, the date of the 3rd of July, and add a live extension because I have already uh, the, this layer existing. Click on Save. Here we are going to select the geometry type and make it to point. And now you can click on OK. So here you have a new uh, shape file layer. Now we are going to edit this layer with the toggle editing uh, tool here with the pen icon. And we are going to add a points feature to this layer from Joban to Cape Town. But we want to benefit from this current vector field here and avoid significant wave height maximums here. To do so, I'm going to select the add feature option here. And now we can select the first point in Durban. And each time you have to increase the index. So zero. And now I'm going to add several points. One, two, three. Here we are benefiting from the high currents for, but we try to avoid following the coast, avoid the pattern of a significant wave height maximum here in the background. Five, six. Remind to increase the index each time. It's nine, and the last step is in Cape Town, 10. OK, so now we have added uh, dots to our, uh, to our uh, safe route, OK? So we are going, if we close this editing tool, you can click on Save to save the modifications you have uh, you have set to this layer, okay? And if you go right click on your layer and open the attribute table, you have only indexes here of your dots corresponding to the route you want to do to avoid uh, harsh uh, maritime conditions. So now we are going to add a geometry attributes to these dots, uh, like longitude and latitude. If you want to have a special, uh, special coordinates uh, to navigate. We are going to open the processing toolbox here and select the option add geometry attributes here. We are going to add geometry attributes, so coordinates in longitude and latitude to this uh, shapefile layer containing indexes of dots representing our safe route, avoiding harsh conditions. You can click on run, and now you can see that a new uh, layer, added geom info, has been created. Right click on it, open the attribute table, and you can see that here you have x, x, and y coordinates, longitude and latitude coordinates for each point of your safe route. You can export these coordinates, right click on your layer, click on export and save feature add. For example, you can select a comma separated value, CSV, to create uh, a text file containing each index longitude and latitude for each point of your route. Here you just have to type a name for this export and click on OK. I will not do it, but it's easy to export uh, geometric coordinates. Now, the last step of this training is to convert this layer uh, with dots here in red to lines, 
to export a real shapefile. To do so, again, we open the processing toolbox here, and we are going to select the points to pass function here. And here we want to convert the added geom info layer to, uh, to a line shapefile. You can click on run, close this window, and here we have passes between each point. You just have to right click on your layer, go to properties, and change the representation of these lines. For example, we can select a dash black uh, representation and we can increase the width of these uh, lines. Click on apply and OK. And here you have a safe route uh, made of lines between the Durban and Cape Town Arbor, uh, benefiting from the Aguilas current uh, high speeds and uh, avoiding uh, high significant wave uh, height uh, uh, areas in the South African coastline. So this was just an example. You can do this with uh, other hours or other locations, but it's interesting to see how to use uh, Copernicus Marine Service data in the free GIS software QGIS. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Etienne, for your very interesting presentation. Um, we are a little late. Uh, we are very sorry about this. So we are only going to have a few questions, uh, maybe two questions only for the um, um, for the Q&A session. Um, so the first one we are taking uh, is the following one. What is a good way to find the bias comparison between simulated and in-situ data where both data sets are asynchronous in time, resampling and tabulation, or is there a more accurate method? Um, well, if I can begin to answer, uh, I think the... Um, uh, it depends on what you intend to do with um, uh, with your study. Uh, resampling and interpolation are both uh, useful methods. And so just to follow with the second question, is there a notebook for an example of spatial interpolation of 2D or 3D data? Uh, yes, there is. The notebook on the cyclone uh, does an interpolation. Uh, but I'm going to provide you a more detailed answer in the in the in the file that we are putting on the on the Padlet. Does anyone want to complete this uh, answer? Uh, I can maybe add something about like the comparison between uh, in situ and uh, space based data. For uh, it, it really depends on the parameter you are looking at because, for example, for a uh, sea surface temperature. Uh, it can experience uh, some great uh, diurnal variations. So, for example, if you're uh, looking at a space-based product from, um, I don't know, for example, noon or 11 a.m. and an in-situ measurement from 11 p.m., uh, you will not get uh, the same uh, reference at all. Um, so really, the, the way it's advised to do it is really take the closest satellite measurement from your in-situ data if you want to calibrate uh, both methods and be able to uh, check that uh, both data sources are consistent uh, with each other. If you're looking for some more static parameters, maybe the chlorophyll concentration, for example, then you can allow yourself a bigger uh, time window to compare uh, satellite-based products and in-situ data. Okay, uh, thank you for this answer. I think that will be all for the Q&A session. Again, uh, we will answer all your questions uh, and you will find all the answers in the Padlet. I think Roman has uh, an announcement to make. Yes, before, uh, I just want to say that uh, we have closed the Padlet session and uh, we can barely hear you. Wait, yeah, we can't hear Ooh, you. Sorry, sorry, that's... Uh, <laughs> On my so uh, is it the end of this workshop? Yes, but on our journey, maybe not. Uh, you can keep posted uh, either through our website or our Twitter account uh, because we will have 
soon an announcement to make. We will organize a marine hack for Africa in early uh, 2022. So um, if you follow us, you will uh, not miss this information to join us. And in the meanwhile, you can also, I don't know, start to imagine your marine application with our data uh, that you can submit uh, to, for the hackathon after. So yeah, we hope uh, to see you again there. Thank you. And so this is the end of uh, our workshop. We are we have been very happy to share with you these uh, three days. Just to remind you a uh, few information, um, the registration to the Copernicus Marine Service is free and you can have access to the service desk, desk whenever you want. Uh, you're going to receive uh, a thank you email with the link to the Padlet. I uh, will remind you that the Padlet uh, will stay open for months, so, um, so don't be worried about this. Uh, you will also get a feedback survey. Uh, the link is here and will probably be in the chat as well. Um, so it will be very helpful for us if you could answer this survey for us to improve uh, the next workshop we will have. And finally, you will only be not today, but uh, just a few days um, later, within a few days, you should receive your certificate of attendance. And I think that's all. I would like to thank all the lecturers uh, that have uh, presented uh, during this webinar. So in the three days, thank you very much. And thank you uh, to all the participants that attended the this event. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you, Roman. Thank you, <laughs> everyone. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>